We good? We're back? All right, sorry about that. I had some technical difficulties, I guess. Started talking about Big Brother and Facebook didn't like it, so he kicked us out. Um, so let's, uh, let's start back in there. Um, so, so the second character for us to look at, this, this older brother in the story. At first appearance, he's this model child. He's faithful to serve the father, consistent, upright. He doesn't bring shame upon the family. His true motives, though, are shown when the younger brother returns. This older brother also only cares about his relationship with the father so far as it benefits himself. We see that the older brother is actually not so different than the younger brother. The older brother has a sense of entitlement from the father because he has been the faithful son. The older brother, he's harder to recognize, making him in some ways more of a dangerous position to be in. You see, the younger brother, he's easy to find. They're the ones out there that we can say, can you believe he walked away from the church in that way? Can you believe the poor choices they're making? Whereas the older brother is oftentimes the one saying those things. The younger brother is easy to find because he is outside. He's in the world doing his own thing, pursuing whatever it is he desires. The older brother, though, he'll be found inside, sitting on a pew, maybe even standing in the pulpit. The older brother serves faithfully because he thinks it makes the father owe him. This mentality is evidence when things don't go the older brother's way. When things don't go our way, do we start saying things like, no, God, you can't can't do this. Like, I've been the faithful son. I've, I've given. I've served. I'm, I'm in ministry. You can't allow whatever this is to happen. Do we begin to bargain as if God somehow owes us because we've been such good children? The older brother goes through the motions but has no real love for the father. This is evidenced by his lack of love for the things and the people whom the father loves. The father loves his younger son who returns, celebrates it. The older brother doesn't care. The older brother thinks that compassion is overrated. The older brother believes that some deserve it, some don't. The older brother doesn't care about his fellow brother being reconciled to the father. The story is really, it's an indictment on the older brother. The religious, the seemingly righteous Because it ends with the rebellious younger brother being reconciled to the father, but the older brother being outside of the celebration and the father pleading with him to come in. These are the the two types of sons we see in this story. But if we stop at just observing these two characters, we really miss the overall uh, greater picture of what's happening in the story. We, We miss what actually makes this story be a story, and that's the third character, the father. We find a father who loves his younger son, even when his younger son wants nothing to do with him. We find a father who pays the price to forgive his son. He he bears the shame. He takes on the financial cost. This is actually why uh, a well-known pastor, Tim Keller, he calls this actually the story of the prodigal God. Because why would this God, why would this father forgive and love his son in this way? We find a father who loves and accepts a son who has done nothing but brought him shame. But we also find a father who loves an arrogant, prideful son who really has no desire for relationship with his father either. A father who loves both of his sons in ways that neither of them deserve. We look at these two sons and we want to focus in on them because they represent us, but we so often forget to consider the kind of love that this father displays. And we see the love that this father displays even more when we take this parable and put it back into the context of what's happening here as we consider the the grand story, the grand scheme of what's happening inside of the story that Jesus is telling And in the context of what is happening, I believe we're actually introduced to a fourth character. The better brother, we might call him. Because when we take this story back to the context of what's happening, here's what we find. Obviously, this is easy for us to recognize. The tax collectors and sinners, they're the younger brother. 
And again, in the scheme of things, these are bad dudes. We talked about this before. They're, they're traitors to their countrymen. They're cheats. They make a living off of cheating their countrymen, these tax collectors. Right? These are these younger brothers who have done egregious, terrible things to their countrymen. We find the Pharisees are the older brother. Again, these are the righteous people, the model Jew. And oftentimes we give the Pharisees this bad rap. But in reality, these Pharisees, their main point was, hey, God's given us these promises. If we live properly, we receive these promises. And so the Pharisees, they're trying to get the people of Israel to live rightly before God so they might receive his promises and his blessings. But they take it too far because they think it becomes this thing of, I do these things and you owe us these things, God. And we have these expectations that we fill our end of the bargain and you have to fill your end of the bargain, God. And interestingly here, we see Jesus speak into the, into the tension between these two different parties. And the first two parables he shares as something being lost, who are searched for, who are found, and the celebration ensues. Similarly, we have in this third story, ones who are lost, then found, and then celebration ensues. But it's recognized in this story that the Pharisees, they're really the ones who are lost and needing to be found. And the story ends with a cliffhanger as to whether they will come into the celebration or not. But there is one element in this story, this parable, that we don't see quite as much that we see in the first two parables. Where's the searching? Something's lost, but where's the searching? We find a father looking for his sons, and he goes after his son on his return. We find a father who goes out to his son when he's outside the party. But where's the searching that we see in the, the parables where the, father le- or the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep to go find the one? Or where the, the woman sweeps the whole house to find the one lost coin? Where is that searching that we see? In fact, what we find here in this story is that searching is taking place right here in this moment with this better brother that we find in Christ, who is the one who's searching for them both, who is the one going after the younger brother, who is the one going after the older brother. Remember, the younger brother is there returning in repentance to him. He's come, he's found them, and they are gravitating to him. It's the Pharisees and the scribes who are off to the side saying, what is going on? Who is this guy? But he doesn't, Jesus doesn't look at them and go, Yeah, you guys, you've got no hope. You're gone, right? He gives them this story to pursue after them, to leave the question for these religious people. Are you going to return to the Father? Are you going to come into the celebration of the work that the Father is doing? In the story, we would expect the older brother to go searching. In the context of what's happening, the older brother ought to be the one going to search again. Why were the people of Israel chosen? If we, if we start and we look at, the, at all throughout the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they were set aside so that they might be a picture of God, of God to the rest of the world, as his representatives to the rest of the world, to bring the rest of the world in worship to this God, right? And they were supposed to do that. Yet here you have these Pharisees, these leaders of the Jewish people who they're not living lives to then point people and bring them in worship to God. They're living lives in order to say, look how much better we are than you. You are under his condemnation. These, these older brothers who are excluding the younger because compassion's overrated. They're sinful. They're, they're dirty. They're unclean. Yet here we have this older brother, this Christ, Jesus, who steps in and says, hey, they won't pursue after their younger brother, but I'm going to come and I'm going to pursue after both. And in this moment, we actually see the depths to which this father goes to show his love to both the younger and the older brother. Because here in this moment, we have this better brother, Jesus, who is standing here in this story pursuing after both. A son who would leave his place next to the Father. His place in glory and and honor next to the Father. And would step down into human history. Take on the form of a frail human being. We love these bodies. We think we're so great. They're so great because it's all we've known. But here we have the God of the universe. 
right? In all his greatness and glory saying, yeah, I'll take on that human form. To come down to pursue after us. When we take this parable back to what is happening, we see, we truly see the love of this father. We find a father who does send a better brother after the other brothers. What we find with this story is a reality that Christ brings the father's love to his children, even when we have run away from him. Even when we reject him and we bring shame and we rebel against him, he still sent his son after us to redeem us so that we might be brought back into relationship with him. We see a father who loves his self-righteous children who bring him shame by refusing to love those who he has loved so much that he paid the price for, who he died for. And every time we, as the older brother, refuse to love and forgive whoever it is who's been running from God, when they repent, we shame the name of our Father. Every time we, as believers, as people who would fall into this category of this older brother, every time we want to look at others who are out in the world and we we want to separate from them and we want to say they don't deserve the Father's love, they don't deserve to be in relationship with the Father, we shouldn't care about them. Who cares about them? We shame our Father. Because we've been called to follow this example that we have in Christ as a better brother. And so, as we conclude our time this morning, let me ask you this. Are you the younger brother? Are you running from the Father, pursuing after whatever pleasure you seek? Whether it be things of the world to get away from the older brother, to have freedom? Maybe you've been running for a while and you're coming to the end of yourself and finding you're empty. Maybe you've just started running and are feeling the rush. Stop running The Father's love is so much better. Stop running. Being in relationship with Him is so much better. Stop running. Repent. Return home. There's coming a time when that offer is no longer on the table. And interestingly, in the same conversation, just a little bit further on, Jesus shares another story about a man who pursued all the things of this life, And when he died, he found that really where he had made his bed when he had run from the Father. Are you the older brother this morning? Do you, do I, do we only serve, only have a relationship with God because of what we think it makes him owe us? Do we bring shame to his name by the way we refuse to love and forgive those who we don't think deserve God's forgiveness? Do we care about others being reconciled to God? Like for the younger brother, the call in this story is the same for us, to repent. It is implicit, but the call is to change and to come into the celebration of God's love for his children. How are we going to be the better brother like Christ? As this conversation ends in Luke 17, Jesus gives commands to his disciples to care for their younger brother to rebuke them and pursue them and to forgive them. And he also warns them against serving God with the expectation that God will somehow owe them. In short, Jesus calls us to pursue the younger brother as he pursued them. Jesus calls us in a world that writes people off, in a world that causes division. We see so much division and so much pain, so much hurt in our world today. He says in a world that does that, we are called to search for others like He searched for us. To sacrifice for others like He sacrificed for us. And so the question, church, this morning, how are we going to respond to the loving call of our Heavenly Father? We're going to pray and we're going to close this time and open up a time of invitation as JT leads us in this last song of worship. And I don't know where you are this morning watching this from home. I don't know Uh, the situations you're in, the places you're at. 
but the call is still there to come to the Father. And this morning, you need to make a decision. And this morning, you need to um, get counsel, whatever it might be. This church here, it's here for you as a resource to love you, to pursue after you like our Savior pursued after us. You can get in contact. You can go to robinwoodbc.org. You can fill out a card there, and they'll get in contact with you. You can call up to the church office, and they'll get in contact with you. But let us respond this morning to the loving call of our Father to come home. Lord, we thank you for this time, God. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for this story, this, this true reality that the better brother, Christ, he has come for us. That when we were far from you, whether the younger or the older brother, he stepped down and pursued after us that he was your extension of love to us, that we might be brought back into relationship with you. May we live in that reality. May we turn to you. May we experience the true life and joy that comes from relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.